Um, so this is uh, Heroes X meets Classics Confidential. Yes, that's what's happening. Exactly, exactly. So, so, exciting. so our two great traditions are now meeting, yeah. our online traditions. <laughs> so um, just to introduce myself, I'm Claudia Phylos. I work with Heroes X in Hour 25. And I'm Elton Barker, I'm at the Open University, and I'm here representing Classics Confidential. And the boot's on the other foot, because it seems as though I'm being interviewed, yes. rather than being the interviewer, so I'm a little bit uncomfortable. <laughs> yes. We'll see how it goes. So, Elton, uh, thanks for taking the time to talk with me Pleasure. today. So, can you just start off by talking a bit about the digital projects that you work on? Because um, I think our community would be very interested in the work that you're doing. Um, and I'll start talking, and then you should interrupt to stop me... No going off on one because okay. there are three interlocking okay. projects. So I start off with the Hestia project. This is where things uh, started themselves for me in, the, in this digital world. So mm -hmm. the Hestia project is an investigation in the way in which Herodotus organizes space in his narrative. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about Herodotus' histories, prehistorian, um, 5th century BC. He's talking about the conflict between his peoples, the Greeks and the Persians. And in order to explain why it was that these two peoples came into conflict with each other, he goes about the known, the known world and describes it. Mm -hmm. And what we're particularly interested in exploring is the way in which he um, associates places together, how he connects places. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we wanted to do this in order to confront and in many ways challenge the usual dichotomy that people... Kind of, um, build into Herodotus. Mm -hmm. it just Which is what? Well, what do you, what well do you to some think? extent, it's there in the way he, uh, in, the, in the opening paragraph, where he talks about his peoples, the Greeks versus the, the Persians, the barbarians. Mm -hmm. So you do get a sense of an East versus West clash, mm -hmm. and that, this, of course, has been hugely influential for uh, the history of ideas ever since. That's and we're still living with it. Um, but Herodotus himself is much. Uh, much more careful about the way he sets up this opposition. So for sure we end up with this big conflict between the Greeks and the Persians. But as scholars have been recently pointing out, people like Chris Pelling, and I mention Chris because he's part of the Hestia project, mm -hmm. the, this idea of the self versus the other, the Greeks versus the barbarians, gets challenged and deconstructed all the way through the narrative. And in particular, in a geographical perspective. So we get right at the beginning... Herodotus is talking about how the Persians view the world in, in, in particular um, sections and that they're happy with ruling over their section, which is in the east, and the, they understand the Greeks want to rule over their section in the west. But this is put in the mouths of these kind of Persian logoi, these Persian wise men. And Herodotus himself, it, the way in which he organised his space in his narrative deconstructs that boundary between mm -hmm. East and West. Um, he, there's, a, there's a famous passage in Book 4 where he talks about these schematic representations of the world and precisely in these kind of big power blocks uh -huh. between Libya, Europe and Asia. And um, he laughs at these representations because they're too schematic. So what's really at the heart of this investigation, what's really at the heart of the Hestia project, is to try to think about the way in which space is represented in narrative. Okay. So, trying to get away from cartographic uh, depictions of space. So, let me give you an example. A clear example of the difference between uh, cartographic visions of space mm -hmm. and the way in which we're trying to investigate the way Herodotus organizes space in a discursive manner, in his narrative. And this is an example that many people have discussed, that Alex Purvis, for example, yes. uh, in a recent book, Space and Narrative, does a very good job of this. Yes, has he been tweeting about this, I believe, right? Yeah, That's yeah. Where it gets. So, Aristagoras, uh, Tyrone of Miletus, comes to Sparta, tries to get the, one of the Spartan kings, Cleomenes, on board with, uh, basically, a rebellion against the Persians. Mm -hmm. And he comes, and he brings with him, in order to persuade Cleomenes, a map, some kind of engraving. Okay. And it, yeah, it's the, one of the first examples of a map that we have, um, you know, we could go back to Homer, but let's stay with you right a minute. Okay. And the way in which the map is being used is very interesting because it's being used as a tool of persuasion. It's mm -hmm. to, in order to give Cleomenes the, the idea that it's actually really easy to go from your power base in Greece here across the sea 
uh, to Sardis, which is kind of the, the far, furthest east place that the Greeks were very familiar with. Mm -hmm. And then by step by step by step, finally you're in Susa, and Susa's got all this stuff that you'd really want. Mm -hmm. And so this is a really nice way in which we see the um, with the use of the map and its pretense that this uh, this conceit that it can represent space accurately, mm -hmm. the collapsing of boundaries and distinctions. And when two things are really interesting. First of all, the immediate context, which you know, the, the story that we have uh, with Aristagoras and Cleomenes. Cleomenes has to go away and think about it. He's Spartan, so it takes a long time to think about these things. <laughs> and he comes back you know, three days later and asks, well, so how far is it? By the way, to the to, yeah, to the to this uh, place you talk about, Susa. Oh well, it's thirty days from the sea. You know, and at this, you know, Cleomenes kicks Aristagoras out because you know, not only are we uh, thinking in terms of a, uh, a Spartan mindset here, getting to the sea is is far enough, and then what? It's another thirty days on top of that. So already here we get, and this is something that again people have talked about with you others. Is you get different focalizations, different perspectives. And in this case, you get uh, different perspectives on space. Mm -hmm. Aristagoras from Miletus on that Ionian coastline, centre of this uh, thriving metropolis, looking both east and west, and at the centre of all these uh, communication lines. Sparta, way off, mainland Greece, proper Peloponnesus, you know, this almost like an island in and of itself. Thinking about crossing the Aegean Sea, that's a big deal. So you get these conflicting perspectives. So then but what's, but just, just to finish, what... The, What's also then really interesting is that after Herodotus gives us this, um, uh, this episode, he then recounts the same space, ostensibly to bear out the fact that, yeah, it is more or less 30 days, it's actually a little bit more, but what's happening, of course, that he gives you, it takes two chapters for Herodotus to write about this space, he gives you the effort involved. Mm -hmm. you know, it takes this days, and you've got to change wars, then you cross this river, so you get a sense of cartographic, abstract space being being set opposed to a sense of lived space, nice. a sense of space in movement, a sense of space in effort. And that's the key thing that the Hestia project is all about investigating. Now, how does uh, working in sort of in digital humanities help you answer these questions? So that's, that's, the, that's the big question. So the Hestia project initially started off with... Um, kind of a conceptual framework. We had a geographer on board called Stefan Bozorowski. Mm -hmm. So he was providing some kind of uh, contemporary geographical spatial theory. We also had a digital element, and that's provided by Leif Isaacson. And Leif is going to be a constant bad penny that keeps turning up <laughs> okay. in this project. And so we had in mind invest basically having a blended methodology, trying out, it's very experimental, mm -hmm. so trying out different ways in which we can um, investigate space. And, and the digital element we thought would be quite interesting because just at the time the project was starting, this is 2008, we were aware that there was this amazing uh, resource, um, happens to be here, Tufts, yeah, Perseus right. Classical Library, not only you know a digital text, and so you know free online text for us to consult, but more importantly to be able to take and reuse. You know we can do all that free. You know and, and Perseus encouraged that. And what's more, that because it's a digital text, certain aspects of that text are marked up. They're annotated. They're referenced. And what we were interested in, which is space, was marked up in a particular way with place names. Mm. So toponyms were marked up in the text, which meant that. Once we had the digital text, we can then grab all the place names within the text, visualize them, mm. and then you can start seeing interesting things. It's a, it's a way in which the digital medium seems to be enabling this new way in which we think about narrative mm -hmm. from a spatial perspective. Mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. digi the digital world really is a visual medium. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what we found. And you notice things um, visually, you notice patterns, especially mm -hmm, mm -hmm. once they're represented okay. in, in, a, in a graphic form, some kind of map. So, what surprised you most when you saw that visual data for the first time? I think a couple of things. First, I mean, and uh, not all positive. Uh, first, uh, but first of all, we you got a sense of the Aegean focus of Herodotus, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is, of course, not surprising. But mm -hmm. you know, once it's visualised, you see, ah, oh, 
you've got this massive concentration of places around the Aegean, and then as you get further out, fewer and fewer places being mentioned. We saw some real, real outliers, mm -hmm. but what these were were problems with the data. So be a misidentification oh, of okay. toponyms, place names, for example. So just a very simple point, which is really useful, by visualising data, you can actually make your data better. It, yeah. So that's something that we've done, we give it back to Perseus, and you get this kind of mutual uh, enhancement. But we, we, we then came across this challenge, so we were visualising this in GIS, and there are two problems with this geographic information system. First of all, you know, it's a system, mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's a technological platform that's not particularly intuitive. It's a little tricky to use. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, if you're trained in geography, that's all well and good, but if you're a classist like me, mm -hmm. with this kind of technological apparatus, it, it's pretty tricky to do all these kind of queries and things. It's not, a, it's not a browsing interface. And so that was one problem that I was relying upon, uh, a lot upon Leaf to help me mm -hmm. uh, just with some basic querying. Secondly, and again, it's the issue with a, it being a system, it's point-based. Mm -hmm. so you get these dots on a map. And that, for us, I'd say, after the initial thrill of being able to see all the places he had as mentions and get a sense of his gaze, we were confronted with precisely the problem we are trying to avoid, which was a sense of space as, a, as dots on a map and static. And what we, what we wanted to do was to introduce movement mm. into this and connections mm -hmm. into this. And so that required different strategies, and there were two. So first of all, and this um, I just mentioned briefly this element because then I can start maybe talking about the other projects. Yes. So we had in mind, as I said before, to try to challenge this boundary between East and West. Because you know, this is something Herodotus himself sets up to a certain extent, but also challenges and laugh, he laughs at these schematic divisions. Mm -hmm. And so we were already encouraged by the author himself to kind of think uh, much harder about the way in which space is being organised. And so we came up with some ways in which we could try to extract um, connections between places. Mm -hmm. Basically a rudimentary network, mm -hmm. a diagram. Um, and we had, a, again, some different strategies to do this. One was just reading through one section of the text, book five, myself and uh, Stefan, the geographer, trying to look at the different spatial relationships in the text and then visualising it. And one thing that we noticed immediately, again, going back to the text, and that's always the lesson here, that, mm -hmm. you know, that, that you, you've always got to go back to the text, and all the digital resources that you can use are for enabling you to think about the text in different ways. So it's always leading you back to the It's text. always leading you back, and it's always up front and centre. Whilst there's a whole load of spatial concepts that we haven't captured. Mm. And I'll give you one example, and that's the idea of the proxy. So, for example, Herodotus might say at one point Darius um, was in Scythia. Okay. Now, he doesn't want us to imagine Darius is on some kind of summer holiday jaunt in Scythia. Yeah. What he really means is the Persian occupying force are in, are in this territory that we know as Scythia. Okay. But, of course, that wasn't marked up in the text because it was the, the Herodotus there is using Darius as a proxy right. for Persia. Right. So that was an instant lesson. There was a lot of spatial information that we just weren't capturing using the, the, the digital markup just mm -hmm. on place names alone. Then the other problem was once you've represented this and you start drawing the connections between places, so in other words, your auditors will mention these places in the same sentence, mm -hmm. and so he's, there's some kind of conceptual link between them. Mm -hmm. so this is really fascinating for thinking about patterns, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You then visualise this, and what you get is a spaghetti monster. Okay. You know, it's just too much data. So this was, again, an issue of the new medium, an issue of visualisation, and it's a problem that we're still, still trying to overcome. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, you can kind of strip away some of it, make it a little bit easier to read, and you get a sense, and we're concentrating on book five, um, of the beginning of clustering of relationships. Mm -hmm. And what was quite interesting here was in just thinking in terms of, kind of network pictures, uh, initially, um, with uh, networks between places where there was no movement and no transformation, so you are just comparing one place to another or saying one place is proximate to another, mm -hmm. you have a very kind of flat network. There aren't many central nodes. It's a very spread out depiction. Mm -hmm. 
Contrast that to when he's talking about movement and transformation. So, for example, one place or one people's invading another place, mm -hmm. you suddenly get this clustering effect. Mm -hmm. And you start getting, actually, the world dividing into two, kind of Greek territories and Persian territories. Mm -hmm. But, so, you, they're, they're again, thinking of that, that kind of big framework that we're talking about, East versus West. You start seeing that emerge in Book 5, but of course it's much more complicated. There are, of course, connections across the two. There's, in fact, an in already an interesting tension in the Greek sphere mm -hmm. between Athens and Sparta, mm -hmm. already in Book 5. Right, right. And you've got Miletus as this kind of uh, a gateway through the two. So it's not just a question that the, you've got the aggressor, the aggressors, Persia, and then you know the poor Greeks to get invaded. You've got Miletus as, this, as a, almost like a, a gateway mm -hmm. through, with, with Miletus pulling kind of the Greeks and the Persians together. Mm -hmm. So the networks we're still trying to interpret already, I think, are helping to break down you know, kind of this simplistic division is much more complicated. Basically. And that seems very authentic to sort of the mission or the yeah. state and objectives of Herodotus because in the beginning he that's says, right. you know, there are some cities who were small. Exactly. Right? And that's, that, that fantastically brings me on to the second point, which is, a, a, um, again, a visualization challenge. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've now got beyond the idea of a point geometry that the GIS system kind of gives you. Um, so we've got these network connections, but they're still static. Mm -hmm. And so we were also interested in society where you're talking about how one place is small and becomes big. Right? So, so change and movement, how space moves, <laughs> exactly. So we developed um, a platform for reading the text spatially. Mm -hmm. So you could read through the text, and as you read through the text, you can actually see the places visualizing that bit of the text mm -hmm. uh, on a map and you see how they change and move. Mm -hmm. And this was in collaboration with Nick Rabinovitz, who's a, uh, a JavaScript developer. And what I really liked about this was that this is, sits in a browser. It sits in a website. Okay. So you can then... It's a, it's a new way of reading a text, really. Mm -hmm. And this led into the second digital... which was then exclusively yeah. a digital project, uh, Google Ancient Places. Yeah. And so this uh, was a project with myself, with Leaf, Mm -hmm. I told you he'd turn up again. Okay. Uh, I still haven't got rid of him yet. We'll come back to that. Uh, uh, Eric Kanza, who is the uh, director of Open Context, mm -hmm. which is um, an open archaeological data repository uh, at uh, University of uh, California, Berkeley. And Kate Byrne, who is a developer uh, at the Institute of Informatics in Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. So again, you get a sense of a collaborative team. Slightly different makeup from the last one, but that's mm -hmm. because it's much more um, on a development issue. Mm -hmm. And the Google Ancient Places project, we got some money from Google, the Google initial round of Google Digital Humanities Awards, and I think Perseus, again, was successful in that. And our idea was, okay, can we... We've, We've managed to capture place names in a encoded text, so that is to say, not just as plain text, digital text, but mm -hmm. that's already been marked okay. up in a particular mm -hmm. way. Whether that was semi-automated or by hand, anyway, the the text was there in Perseus, and we got that with one author. We got the place and visualised it. Okay, that's good. Can we scale that up? Mm -hmm. and, and it was a Google challenge, so can we scale that up to potentially any book yeah. in the Google Works corpus? Right. And so this was the Google Ancient Places project. Uh, so we developed this, um, this method of extracting, um, on a purely automated level, mm -hmm. um, all place names in a text and then visualizing it. Yeah. And so this, uh, and I was particularly interested, of course, in the, in the, the visualization mm -hmm. package, and then we started to go beyond just the simple place uh, uh, page that we had with the Hestia project, where you had the text in one reading pane, um, you've got the map in another reading pane, you've got a kind of timeline or book line underneath, and you can simply scroll through, see the text change here as you read through the text, the place is mentioned in this piece of the text being visualised moving in and out of focus. Mm -hmm. So precisely what you get is a sense of movement. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's one, that's one kind of platform. But we then were experimenting with different kind of visualization techniques that the digital uh, medium can enable you to do. So you can now have a landing page and you get a snapshot 
of the spatial breadth and density of all the places. So you get the, you know, let's say, landing page of Herodotus' histories, all the places Herodotus is mentioned on a map, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, it's a kind of heat map, so the, the hotter the symbol, the more times that place is mentioned mm -hmm. in the text, and also a handy cartogram, uh, again, on the, on the right-hand side, ranked according to the number of uh, references each place has, mm -hmm. and also where, in a book. So you get, a, at a glance, you can see, oh, these places are mentioned most often in Herodotus, and also where. And instantly, again, what was really fascinating, just a very simple point, um, the top place mentioned in Herodotus was Hellas, Greece. Uh -huh. But only as you were getting to the end, of the narrative, which of course, when you know the stakes are high, when when you're really fighting for Greece, and you have that, safe, yeah, yeah when the, almost like a concept of Greece is coming Developing, into, yeah. yeah, exactly coming into being, and we and we could see that, it's and you can go through all the different other places and then see you know where and when they're mentioned. So there, of course, this isn't again really telling you anything. What you're there, what it's doing is drawing attention to patterns that you can then. Either fit into an existing theories or use to challenge other things. Basically, the job of interpretation. I don't think that's for us. <laughs> so, but it, what's great is that you're always working to enable new ways to answer, uh, to right. even ask new questions, right? right? To see new questions, questions that you wouldn't be thought of otherwise. That's right. I'm, I'm always with a view to of making this technology as user friendly as possible. Yeah, you know, I'm no uh, coder, so I am. You know, I, I'm. The, I was there with the Gap project very much as. Okay, that's you know I want to be able to do this. Can you can you mm -hmm, can you mm -hmm, can mm -hmm. you uh, make that happen? So we had the landing page, and then we had this the second reading page. So you can read through the text against the places, or the places against the text mm -hmm. you know, with a timeline underneath. And then we were developing this third page, and this is relevant for moving on to the, the final project. project yes. And the third page was focusing in on any one place that's mentioned in the text. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple of interesting features there. First of all, you, you kind of got the place mentioned on the map. You've also got a very rudimentary network. Mm -hmm. So that was, again, trying to bring in uh, visualizations and methodologies and theories that we've been playing around mm -hmm. elsewhere, trying to bring that into this kind of uh, visualization package. So places mentioned in the same breath with this other place. Okay. So a network that's not based on real life networks or topographical yeah, proximate yeah. places, but according to narrative significance mm -hmm. precisely. So you get again a sense of uh, what places get mentioned in relation to what, what other places mm -hmm. in the world. And imagine you can scale that up to looking at any you know ancient author and see see if there are these patterns of places reoccur over time or whether they substantially differ or whatever. Because this approach to looking at patterns with you know different ideas occurring together, yeah. that's um, I think that's a very powerful way of looking at literature generally, right? right? Except now you're using it in a, in a new way, in a that's new right. realm, yeah. That's right, and being able to visualize it is actually very effective totally right. for the visualization. Which is so fascinating for me because I like to study Homer, and uh, one thing that we've talked a lot about in our community is the way that Homer is so visual, right? Right, and so it's sort of it's sort of recreating that's, this whole process. That's very true. In fact, if I may, um, just yes, have please. just have um, a slight detour with Homer. Yes, and the detour, this, right? this always for Homer. There's always room for detour. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, you will know that, of course, Jane Shouse Clay has written this book on you know, trade and theatre, and she's also been working with the group in the University of Virginia called Neatline yes, yes. for visualising places in Homer. And um, this was um, a year and a half ago in Berlin. She had a paper with her graduate students, um, te technical graduate students, um, in in Berlin on the catalogue of ships. Mm -hmm. And yes. what's really fascinating, and, and this is a, a very simple point, and it precisely proves uh, the importance of being able to visualise stuff. So she was looking, if I get the argument right, sure. it was a while ago, so okay, sorry, yeah. sorry Jenny if I get this right, if I screw this up totally. Um, looking at the, the catalogue in terms of um, sequence, mm -hmm. narrative sequence, when places mm -hmm. are mentioned, and then being able to visualise it, you're immediately struck by some very interesting patterns. First of all, you, you get a start off with mainland Greece, and you get a kind of 
um, a clockwise movement around Greece, mm -hmm. which makes sense as you know, his homo recounts the places in order, going around you know, central Greece and uh, Peloponnese. So you kind of get a kind of periplus, a kind of voyage effect, mm -hmm. which, which becomes actually quite significant in later mm -hmm, mm -hmm. literature. Then there's a bit of an oddity when you get to um, kind of more central or northern Greece. I'll come back to that in a second. The Trojan catalogue is really organised very differently. You have um, spokes on a wheel effect. Yeah. And that's because you have Homer mentioning all these Trojan allies, but at each time he's going out from the centre mm -hmm. of Troy. So not, yes. not going around a periplus effect, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. you know, you've got Troy as the centre and then going out, like spokes on the wheel. And that seemed to be going, then they were going back to this kind of problematic pattern um, in, in the kind of middle bit of the Greek catalogue. Mm -hmm. That seemed to be happening also with this Greek catalogue, but the central spoke was missing. Mm -hmm. And the central spoke was missing, and this was the thrilling aspect for me was Thebes. And you'll know that Joel Christensen, mm -hmm. you know, who I've been writing stuff yes, with, yes. and I are Working precisely on. investigating. Um, this the hidden aspect of Thebes and Homer, how Homer basically silences the Greek tradition. You have uh, the, the Greek uh, the Greek tradition about Thebes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, the epic tradition, um, so and that was really nicely visualised in this you know, the, the the neat line uh, digital uh, platform. So what it seems like what you're saying is this visual medium that you're uh, or these visual representations that you're yeah. achieving through your digital approach, it really helps you see things like accent signifiers. They become that's better. right. Yeah. That's right. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's really the, 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 the key. You, there's not just what you see on a map, but also, again, oh, why isn't that there? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, that should be there. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, that's really fascinating. I mean, certainly thinking in terms of Herodotus, there are some key areas that seem to be less... Uh, talk about Cyprus, okay. which ought to be really important, but doesn't seem to be Crete, maybe mm -hmm. too. So which is super interesting because what he says is, you know, everything changes. You know, cities come up and down, but so it's hard to know. I'm going to mention everything, basically, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. he doesn't really mention everything, That's so right. it's significant. And one of the most important places, just in terms of hits in the Herodotus, is Samos. Mm -hmm. And you yeah, know, and again, there's been very good recent work about how important Samos is, particularly for thinking in terms of. Um, reception of Herodotus in an Athenian context mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, in the aftermath of the Samian revolt and mm -hmm. uh, Pericles' brutal suppression of that. So Samos is important in Herodotus and there's always this point where you go back to and that's very obvious when you, when you visualise that. It's beautiful. So let's talk, let's go back now to your third project. The third project. So this is going back to this, this gap page, the the place book page, as we would like to call it, but obviously we can't for, yeah. um, for certain reasons. Um, so you've got to focus on a particular place. You've got the network, but there's now also this feature where you've got other resources okay. related to this place. Okay. And so what's happening there is. What do you mean by resources? Well, anything else online that references this place. Okay. So now we're going beyond just this particular te one yes. text you're looking at to potentially any other text that has got this place mentioned in it and any other kind of document, actually. So not just text, actually, but also archaeological material, images, databases, maps. And this is the world of linked data, mm -hmm. and this is the Pelagios project. Right. And that's basically why I'm here with uh, the Perseus crowd. Again, I'm here working with Leaf. It's you know, his his conception really about um, how we can use the power of uh, of the web for being able to enable the linking between different projects. Mm -hmm. So not trying to aggregate everything in one you know and have one super uh, hub, but actually enable projects to be able to communicate with each other. So mm -hmm. you know you're working in your project, I'm working in my project. We're representing the data. Um, and structure it in a particular way that's suitable for our projects, but nevertheless, by using the power of linked data, we can enable connections to be made between our different projects yeah. without trying to centralise everything. The other person who's been with us from the beginning with the Pelagios project is Raina Simon. He's a developer mm -hmm. at the Austrian Institute of Technology. Mm -hmm. I should mention Leif Isaacson is at Southampton. Mm -hmm. And together we're um, Pelagius, we now have a new uh, person on board too, uh, Pau de Santo, mm -hmm. who is at Southampton too. And the way Pelagius works is very simple. We've tried to keep things as simple as possible. I'm a simple person. So. Okay. And also keep the barrier of entry low. Mm -hmm. 
um, and that is your place. You know, basically, we're enabling the the connection between documents through common references to places. Mm -hmm. So, if your document, like I said, however you conceive that, whether it's a text or an image, mm -hmm. a database, map, whatever, if it references a particular place. All you have to do is to annotate just gonna those places. It's yeah. that annotation for yeah. size it is. So it's additional data on top of however whatever structure you want. Mm -hmm. So it's just a, it's just an add-on feature. We don't have anything to do with your data. So it's, you just annotate your place and you use an appropriate gazetteer. We've started off with the ancient world, so mm -hmm. the appropriate gazetteer of the ancient world is Pleiades, mm -hmm. you know, based on the Barrington Atlas. And so you just annotate your pla the places in your document according uh -huh. to the particular, they call them uniform resource identifiers, URIs. Uh -huh. yep. Basically, this is just, you know, security, social security number for places. So you can then disambiguate, you know, uh -huh. there are 17 or so Alexandria. So which Alexandria right. do you mean in your document? And it, just by doing that, you then enable your data to be discovered by the other members of the Plagios community, which right. is what we are. We're basically a, a decentralized network. And so that means as a user, I can be in my text, looking at Herodotus, focusing on this particular place, let's say Samos, and then, you know, I want to know a little bit more about Samos. I want to find out all the other places Samos has been mentioned, in Greek right. or indeed Latin literature. And I want to know about the archaeological data that's been discovered there, if there are any images of Samos, yeah, all stuff like that. Right. That's how Palagios works. Well. Beautiful. <laughs> That's amazing. So, so then, what's the future? I mean, it, I mean, this is the future, but it is the future. How, how? Let's say, how long do you feel like this project right now? How long will it take you to reach sort of the goal that you have? Well, what's, you in the process? what's really interesting is we have two phases of Palagios. Um, one was a proof of concept, and then the second one was actually really expanding this network so now we have not just individual projects uh, but larger institutions Perseus is involved, the German Archaeological Database, the British Museum, the British Library, mm -hmm. the Ancient World Mapping Centre mm -hmm. you know basically any digital project dealing with the ancient world come and join us Okay, mm -hmm. so we've been dealing with the ancient world we've just recently got some funding from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation in September uh, Plagios 3, and this is now to extend what we've proven with the ancient world and with this ability to live between documents and the ancient world to any early geospatial document mm. up until the discovery of the Americas. That's just a kind of handy cut off point. And also because, and this, this fundamentally, for me at least, gets back to why I'm interested in this conceptions of the world that are not Google Maps. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, different ways of thinking about the space around us. And of course, you know, once we get to discover the Americas, we basically are still living with that map, however that's projected. Mm -hmm. it's, it's still very much that map. So I'm really interested in alternative ways of viewing space. So that's kind of a useful, conv a convenient cut-off point. On the other hand, that's still a Greek tradition, a Latin tradition, an early Christian tradition, what's called the portal tradition, so these are nautical charts. Mm -hmm. Uh, so medieval, mm -hmm. uh, Islamic, yes. China. China. Okay, yeah. so now we're moving into different traditions, different gases. So there are three challenges for us. And again, that's one reason why we've been working with the Perseus people here. The three challenges. Because they always have a vision to this, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and, and very much. Really right. And yeah, they, they brought together precisely people in order for this to happen. The three challenges are okay, we're moving out of the ancient world, so we need other. Databases of place names, gazetteers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got a great one for the ancient world, but you know that's great up until about the sixth century AD. What happens after that? What happens when you start moving into the Islamic world? Well, obviously, into China, we need databases, but we don't just want these separate databases. Again, thinking of the principle of linked data, you want these databases to be able to communicate with each other. So again, not one big database gazetteer to all them all, mm -hmm. but individual databases and it can nevertheless allow communication. Mm -hmm. So I might be looking at, you know, let's say take Samos again, and I'm interested not just actually now in the ancient history of Samos, but take it through up to the, the early modern period. Well, to be able to do that, I need to access these other resources who are relying upon these other gazetteers. Mm -hmm. so it's, where it's basically joined, joined up thinking, joining up 
the different strands across the web. Mm. So first of all is basically gazetteer interoperability. That's the first challenge. The second challenge is um, annotation, because a lot of the documents that we're now talking about aren't already annotated. Mm. You know, so far we've been lucky because of Perseus, you know, mm. annotated a lot of place names, other individual projects, particularly those dealing with epigraphy, papyrology, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. papyri.org, for example, Trimagestos. These guys are you know, annotating their documents so they can join the Plagueus crowd. But there's a whole load of documents just online right. um, that aren't annotated. So we're developing, we're, so we're now doing annotation ourselves for the mm -hmm. first time, and as we're doing so, we're trying to develop a really nice handy interface called Recogito. Mm -hmm. You can try it out for yourselves, hopefully soon. Yes, great. And where, so you can annotate your own document. You can just find a document online that deals with... Um, has places in mm. it, and in, we're enabling you to annotate those places in the textual document itself, mm -hmm. and then to map those to a gazetteer so you can then visualize those places. So I'm really interested in the ways that you're creating on ramps for people to participate in That's the right. research that you're doing. That's so right. I know we need to end pretty quickly, but can you just um, say a few words about if you were to give advice to somebody now who is trying to take sort of first steps uh, into the world of digital classics, what, what are the kind of skills that you think would help them get to a place where they could do this kind of annotation? Are you thinking XML? Are you thinking some basic coding? Where where should they head? Beyond it's, reading, it's, reading, reading the text. Yeah, well, it's a fair question. Um, whew. Yeah, XML is good. I can just about understand it, if not do it myself. You know, same with TI, Text Encoding mm -hmm, Initiative, mm -hmm. which is based on XML. Um, JavaScript seems to be a place where people are going, Python, all of these computing languages. So if you are interested in coding, mm -hmm. it's the kind of thing you think you'd be interested in, in doing, then do. But I want to also say that, you know, I'm not a coder. Mm -hmm. I can understand what people are talking about I can understand some of the challenges so I, I know enough now to have a, a relatively intelligent conversation well, I'm not sure about intelligent but yeah, anyway, sure. a conversation yeah. with these people I think the key point is well two key points first of all is that you um, do stuff that you're interested in doing mm -hmm. so if you don't think coding's for you but you still want to be in this digital world you know, don't see that as a barrier mm -hmm. I mean, is, I'm, I'm working in this field and I don't know how mm -hmm. to code secondly and this has been the, probably the most thrilling aspect of the whole thing is that it's collaborative. Yeah. So you don't have to do everything. It's impossible for you to do it. Mm -hmm. You've got your Latin to learn. You've got your Greek to learn. You've got mm -hmm. all the scholarship to read. Yeah, learn some German, learn some French. There's all this <laughs> other stuff. In your spare there. time. There's enough to right. do, okay? Uh, if you can code as well, that's great. But you don't have to. There are other people mm -hmm. who can and are willing to work with you. And there are all these fantastic projects out there. Nearly every one of them is collaborative. So it's a, it's a paradigm shift in the way we do humanities, and that's certainly something they talk about here in Perseus, not just in terms of doing research, actually, but you know, we have done this ourselves this week, where we introduced this um, annotation platform, Recogito, to some undergraduate students. Yes. And with it, when we had, you know, we gave a lecture, we then basically gave them 20 minutes to annotate sections of these texts mm -hmm. that we had uploaded, including Islamic texts. Mm -hmm. So we mm -hmm. had a kind of example case study, and then 10 minutes to try to geo result. And we got thousands of annotations from these students in 20 minutes. I mean, it was mind blowing and so exciting. Wow. And it, and it was real research. Yeah. So, and so it's not just a matter of. Um being exclusive, right? This is about yeah. intergenerational, this is about being welcoming, that's about right. being inclusive. That's so, right. you know, that's the, um, that's very much been the strategy of CHS, the Center yeah. for Planning Studies, where I work for many, many years now. Um, so, and I know that Perseus is the same. I can see that your projects are the same. So, everyone is so appreciative that you're taking that approach. It makes a huge difference. Uh, well, well, I'm doing it because it's fun. Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's really, yeah, and the particular public aspect of it yes, is yes. really important to get people involved. Right, the general interested. public, right? That's Citizen right. scholars. That's right. To use, uh, to to use Greg's words. Yeah, yeah. Greg's words. Right. Okay, Elton, thank you so much for taking the time. I so thank appreciate you so it. Much. Okay, thank you. take care.